Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the Madden America podcast. And this week we chat with Beatrice Birch, who is initiator of the residential healing community Inner Fire. For over 35 years, Beatrice worked as a Hauschka artistic therapist in integrative clinics and inspiring initiatives in England, Holland and the USA, where the whole human being of body, soul and spirit was recognised and appreciated in the healing process. She has lectured and taught as far afield as Taiwan. Her passionate belief in both the creative spirit within everyone and the importance of choice along with her love and interest in the human being has taken her also into prisons, where she has volunteered for many years offering soul support through alternatives to violence work and watercolour painting. In this interview, we discuss how Inner Fire works to help the people that attend and how a core principle of their healing work is that human beings are creators, not victims. Beatrice, thank you so much for joining me today to uh, talk about the work of Inner Fire. And to begin, I wanted to ask a little bit about you and and your background and what it was that led to your interest in establishing a a medication-free healing community. Well, thank you, James. And I want to say that I have been so appreciative of all the work you've been doing over these years and the work of Mad in America and, of course, the catalyst of that Robert Whitaker has created by his Mad in America and his Anatomy of an Epidemic. So it's a pleasure to be part of this movement. I suppose, you know, ever since a very young child, I suppose with my interest in people and their lives, now as an older person, I can say my interest has always been in the resilience of the human spirit and having read biographies of people in concentration camps and sort of wondered, you know, why do some people survive and why do others not? And just, just I've always been someone who has been a listener to people's stories. And so I worked for many years, lived in, in the UK for 25 years and have worked in other parts of the world. And while in the UK, I worked in national health practices where we offered alternatives. And um, I trained many years ago a three-year full-time training as a Hauschka artistic therapist, where we had a lot of medical background. And um, so I had also been a teacher for many years in Bristol and um, Gloucestershire and so on. And um, and then I began to, I was always interested in the healing aspect of education, feeling that our, the children today are our barometers. And so I wanted to become a more artistic person in how I taught, which is why I went in to do the artistic therapy training. But then I was encouraged to stay in the realm of therapeutic work rather than going back into teaching. And so I worked with in different national health practices in the UK and where we never medicated anybody, but it was through the various artistic therapies, music therapy, eurythmy, which is a form of movement, spatial dynamics, another form of movement, yoga, speed charts. And I did, I worked with watercolor, clay, pastel, charcoal, form drawing, um, different mediums, depending on the need of the individual. And we were recognized, we drew the attention of the national health, not so much because of actually what we did, but we cost them less money. People were getting well. A diet was also a very important part of the clinic and clinics that I worked in and what we offered and taught, gardening as well. And so um, it was when now it's nearly 20 years that I returned to the United States and developed, joined a medical practice here, and then also had my own private practice. But I, and I also worked for many, many years in prisons where we, I brought um, alternatives to violence and also did watercolor painting with men in the prisons. And I used to say to the guys, you all want to get out, but I'd love coming in to work with them. It was 
it was remarkable. And I'm incredibly grateful for the extraordinary human beings I met behind bars. Thank you, Beatrice. And can you tell me a little bit about how Inner Fire works to support people who might be struggling? So Inner Fire is a proactive healing community offering people the choice to recover from debilitating and traumatic life experiences, which typically can lead to addiction or mental health issues, but without the use of the psychotropic medications. We're a 501c3, a not-for-profit, and we're also a TCR. We're licensed as a therapeutic community residence, so we're recognized by the state of Vermont. And we're five and a half years old, and we've worked with 30 people to help them reclaim their lives. And the reason for starting Inner Fire, you know, if you had asked me 15 years ago when I'd be doing something like this, and I'd look at you as if, do you know something I don't know? But, um, but I, had, I was working at a rehab in Vermont. And with the Hauschka Artistic Therapy, and that is really all about helping the individual to connect with what I call, without being religious, but the divine creative self. So we all are, in fact, because we're human beings, we're creators, and we're not victims. And I'll come back to that point, but I just wanted to say, these people felt recognized as human beings. I didn't, you know, if anything, their diagnoses might be an indication of what they are wrestling with, but they are essentially human beings struggling with this or that challenge in life. And one day, well, it was actually over about a week, a number of individuals came in, and I, to be honest, I thought it was a bit of a setup, like what's going on here, but they came in individually stood right in front of me, looked me straight in the eyes, and actually said, I hate being medicated. Isn't there a choice? And I began wondering, well, why are you all coming to me? Knowing, of course, I know there's a choice. And I was actually totally shocked when I came back to this country in 99 to see how quickly people were being medicated and no one was in fact being helped with the issues that lie at the root of their challenges, you know? And so I told them of options. I told them of Mad in America. I told them of mindfreedom.org and so on and so on. And eventually they left this rehab. And I heard within two years of each of their departure that six of them had taken their life. And I, to be honest, I felt this was totally wrong, totally unnecessary. And my heart went out to the parents who didn't realize the side effects of these medications. Most of them have a side effect of suicidal ideation or suicide, you know. And I just... I remember standing there alone in the artistic therapy space feeling, I'm out of this. I can't handle this. This is so wrong. And then I realized, no, you're not innocent. And you now know. And you have to find your colleagues and take the best of your life experience and simply offer a choice. So I want to emphasize, we're not telling anyone to come off their medications. but. I understand from parents that we're the only place really in the country that has such a comprehensive program, which will help you, first of all, to avoid medication in the first place, or to taper to a level that works for you, which could be all the way off, or it could be as you taper, you realize, actually, this is my sweet spot. I can be totally engaged in life and quite very happy here. Or for people who have, let's say, come off their benzodiazepines and are still reeling from the side effects of them. So it's all about choice. We're we're actually listening to people. And the tapering process is something that is very, very slow and steady. And I'd like to add that recently when I was presenting at a conference, ISPS conference in Rotterdam, my 
paper, the, the paper that my paper was selected, and it was entitled, Suppose Mental Health is a Reductionist Term for Soul Health. When you think about it, we are not divided up human beings. Our head is part of our whole organism. Thank you, Beatrice. And, uh, and um, you know, obviously, I've spent a good deal of time looking over the website of Inner Fire, which you know, I have to say is, is uh, comprehensive and, you know, it's, it's, it's full of so much good stuff. And I read on there that a foundational principle of Inner Fire is that human beings are creators, not victims. And, you know, that, that appealed to me, that phrase. So I guess I, I wonder how you apply that principle in your kind of interactions when you're, you know, helping people through the work of Inner Fire. It's how we view the human being. And I would say the way we're viewing the human being more and more nowadays is getting pretty scary. So the human being, I would say, in my experience over many years of working with human beings and being aware of this, we all have a body and that we can physically see, but we have invisible parts of us. And one is referred to as the etheric or the life body. And many indigenous communities are very aware of this. And that is where rhythm lives and memory lives and habits live. And for many people, this is why rhythm is so crucially important for children when they're young to establish a rhythm in their life so that they can deal with the more important aspects of life, the deeper, more profound aspects. And then we have what's referred to as the astral body, which is the center of our sympathies and our antipathies. And so you could say the etheric body, and this is all very simply put, but the etheric body and the astral body really create our soul. And you could say the physical body is related to the mineral kingdom, the etheric body to the plant kingdom, the astral body, to the animal kingdom, but then we're human beings and we have the ability to think clearly, and that can take practice, of course. We have the ability to change habits through our thinking. And so, but that part of us, the, what I would refer to as our higher self, the part of us that makes us free from instinct, or reactions. You know, I met a number of remarkable human beings in prison. They didn't stop and think. They reacted. And you can say animals react. We all can react at times. And then afterwards, we can feel ashamed or think, why did I say that? Or why did I do that? But so, you know, Eckhart Tolle and others, the higher self, they refer to it as the witness, the higher self. I like to think of it as the charioteer who guides the wild horses, you know, and we all have wild horses. Adolescence is all about wild horses. And gradually we learn how to guide them and we have a conscience and we think, oh, maybe that's not a good idea. So there we're practicing being human beings. So at Inner Fire, we meet everybody as a striving human being. And, you know, in prison, there was one time when a beautiful young man named Ian, who was 28, came to me. I was painting with him. And he said to me, I was writing to, to a friend on the outside about this art class. And it's so hard to describe what happens here. Eventually, I wrote to my friend, it's an art class, but it's really a spiritual class. And then he looked me straight in the eyes and he said, this is what I was looking for on the outside. Isn't it strange I had to come to prison to find it? And I, I was amazed. And I looked at him and I thought, you all are seekers. You're all looking for something more than this fast-paced, superficial, materialistic life. You know? And so when we were forming Inner Fire, I remember saying to my husband, well, what are we going to call the people who come here? Because I didn't want to call them patients or clients or residents. And you sort of need to differentiate a little bit, even though we're all struggling, striving human beings. And then I thought of Ian and I thought we call them seekers. 
because that's there's an a, there's a verb in that term, and it's something to be proud of. And you're not accepting how things are, but you're seeking for something more. And then I thought, well, then we, as the staff, so to speak, we're guides, but we're guides the way a midwife is a guide to someone giving birth. And the seekers, as I mentioned, you're giving birth. Your mother gave you your physical body, but you're rebirthing yourself through coming to inner fire and tapering from your medication. You're reclaiming your life. And then another image came to me, James, of we're also guides as the banks of a river are guiding the current. We are not blocking the current. The current is the seeker in their life journey. But there are times when the banks have to be tight, have to hold firm in the tapering process. It's not always lovely. And there are times when we can relax and the seekers have more wiggle room, so to speak, and then tight. But they they have the security of us being there. And so also the another image I'd like to do, which is very key to just simply life at Inner Fire, when I speak about rhythm and soul breath. So we all can picture a classroom where the sort of hopeful teacher might put this child who seems to be all over the place in the front row as if that'll help the child to focus. When in fact the child, for one reason or another, has lost their center and they don't even have to turn around to know what's happening four rows back. And then you have another child who can sit in the middle of the classroom and let's say all hell's breaking loose around them, him, but he's so, so centered, he's oblivious. And I would like to offer that any one of us are somewhere, we are all somewhere on this spectrum. And to then to relate it to, you know, if I saw something awful, if I witnessed something awful, I might get stuck in the end breath with, oh, you know, and, and not be able to breathe out for fear of falling apart. What am I going to do with this? Or let's say if I was sexually abused, James, I'm going to be as far out of this body of pain as I possibly can. And the farther out I am, the farther I am from my center, my core, the more apt I am to hear voices. And so inner fire has all to do with the soul breath. So for instance, everybody has their own individual program. And in the mornings, everybody is doing something for the community. When we're ill, we're all to a certain degree self-centered. If I have a migraine, I'm going to ask everyone to please leave the room, close the shutters, you know, just leave me alone right? But so we have this community work where we're out in the mornings, we're either cooking in the kitchen and learning how we're becoming empowered by learning how to cook totally organic, um, really along the lines of the gap diet. So there's no sugar, high protein, high fat, a lot of the vegetables we grow ourselves. So that when you leave inner fire, You can, if you choose to, continue to cook in a way that's really nourishing. We use a lot of the lacto-fermented foods, the sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir, and so on. Or you're working in the garden where we built, we do everything by hand. So we built our chicken coop by hand. And it's not a matter of how fast it takes to do it, but it's a matter of getting ourselves out of our heads into our limbs. And where, so we become, we engage with our whole body. And at least in the United States, we're a pretty head-oriented society, which, if you don't mind me saying, I think that can lead to a pretty psychotic society when we're only in our heads. And so inner fire is about getting people out of their heads into their limbs. So they sow the seeds, they tend the seeds, they harvest the seeds, and so in the plants, the vegetables. And we also have a forest program where you work in the woods and we're clearing a certain wood because we want to turn it into a meadow and have goats and milk the goats and care for the goats and so on. But what I have found very interesting, James, is that in our first year, 
almost six years ago, one young man came in one day and he had been splitting wood for the last couple of hours or so. And he said to me, while I was splitting wood, I heard no voices. Now that's huge. And I've also had people where I've worked with them artistically, where they have been so engrossed in what they're doing that there's been no room for voices. And that's incredibly empowering because as many people know, many people think they're going to be hearing voices the rest of their life. So these moments where you realize, actually, maybe I don't need to. And the other realm of work in the mornings is housekeeping or cleaning. So we use biodegradable cleansers, which you can all make from home. And there's really an art to the cleaning. So it's these four realms, cooking, cleaning, gardening, and forestry, where we work in the mornings. And everyone does everything at some point, you know, during the week and so. And then in the afternoons, we have the artistic therapies, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And we have therapists coming from different parts of the country and also from Europe who offer different therapies. And these artistic therapies have to do with, they cannot be done to you. And there's very little verbal. Tuesdays and Thursdays, we do more of the counseling and the verbal sort of type work. But now, for instance, the conversation is between the clay and you or the color, watercolor and you. So to help people, because I've met many people who in this realm have told me as seekers that um, they say the same thing to every psychiatrist or every counselor, and the counselor thinks they're saying it for the first time, you know? And so we're all clever, you know, but you sort of can't avoid parts of your own self through doing this artistic work. And for instance, there are times where, let's say if someone is, has had a kind of abuse or has lost their center, then no way would I give them watercolor. Watercolor is loosening, you know, and, but rather I would use the watercolor for someone, for instance, who is more stuck and caught in the in-breath. And the clay is a beautiful way of helping somebody come down out of their heads, down more and more into their body. Because you can't do it unless you bring your consciousness into your fingertips. And a nice little anecdote is one summer after we had had one day after we had had a, a canoe trip and I had warned the seekers to put sun cream on and all this. And some people did and some people didn't and there are consequences. But there was one young man I was working with and the poor man, the, the tops of his feet were pretty burned. You know, and so we were going to be doing the clay work in the artistic therapy space. And I thought, you know, let's go to the brook. We have a beautiful brook running along the the edge of the property. And we brought our deck chairs and we sat in the brook so his feet could cool off in this beautiful bubbling water. And we did the clay therapy session in the brook. And it's just sort of, you know, that's we have that freedom here to do what really use your imagination, what needs to be done to support someone in their journey. But so those therapies and then we have um, counseling work and group work, peer work and all that on the Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then in the evenings, we also have some really remarkable um, sharings where we have an appreciation evening where you go around in the circle and you share what you appreciate about everyone in the circle and then yourself and of course the self is the most difficult for all of us guides and seekers alike and um and i want to also emphasize of course we're all guides and we're all seekers and um then we have a sharing a question an evening where no matter what's living in your heart you can turn to the other people and share, give it context and form it into a question because that means you're interested in a response. And anyone who has anything to share can share from their life experience. And maybe it's helpful and maybe it's not. And then we also have a chance to share has, um, if I have an apology to make, and it's not that we go into depth in the moment, but we 
can talk about that later, but it's claiming your voice. So much of this has to do with claiming your voice. Thank you, Beatrice. It's such a beautiful description of what you do. And I think what comes out for me in listening to you is how you honor the individual and honor honor how different people are. And, you know, if I reflect on my own experience of mainstream treatment through psychiatry, it that required me to conform to their way of doing things and their program and their medications. You know, I didn't really feel that they were responsive to me. I felt I had to be responsive to them. But what you're describing is is an ability to adjust and adapt to the individual that you're working with. That's quite the case. But let me say this, James, is I think one of the secrets, I worked at a rehab in Holland where they had a 65 to 70% recovery rate. And they've become a sister organization. Actually, unfortunately, a few years ago, the government withdrew the money, and so they've closed, which is totally crazy. But um, but the rhythm is really important. So we want people, we, have, we offer people the chance to come to Inner Fire for a three-day visit to really get as clear an idea as possible as to how we work. And the rhythm is key. And many people will say, that'll be a relief because at home I have no rhythm at all. I get up at any hour of the day. And that's one of the things when seekers leave in our fire and I ask, so what was most valuable? And they all say the rhythm. Yeah. So people, when you come, you know, when you come for the three days, you get a taste. You get up at six o'clock to get down for breakfast at by 6.45 in case you're taking medication. So then we eat at 7, at 7.30, we start to wash up the dishes, and at 8 o'clock we're going out for a walk, and at 8.30 we have a morning circle where we go around and we share how are we doing and what we are grateful for. And two mornings of the week we have that out in the forest, in the woods, and sometimes, you know, there's snow and we snowshoe to the spot and we build a fire in the snow. And that's pretty cool, you know. But so there is a rhythm. And so and that's key. It's really key to the healing process. So and of course, if somebody is having a difficult time tapering, they may need to go and lie down. They may need to, need to go and rest or they but they need to be alone. They may need to be alone. So they may still garden, still. Our theme song is sort of engage, stay engaged. And if they do stay engaged and at the end of the day, they're glad they can see how I have moved in my day. And whereas I wanted to hide from the world in the morning, I stayed engaged and I'm doing okay now. So I didn't want it to be misleading. James, that the order, the rhythm is crucial, I would say, to the healing. And many of the seekers, when they've left, I think, as I mentioned, you know, they keep the rhythm. Diet and rhythm is something that they are faith, typically faithful to, you know. Yeah, fantastic. I, I, I can see how important that is. And Beatrice, I, I wanted to ask, obviously, in, in looking at the information on the site and what you've related there, you know, there are a, a huge amount of activities and different approaches and, you know, so many options for people. But I, I was interested to see that as part of your team, you also work with a psychiatrist. And so, you know, I, I wondered how, you know, how the kind of more biologically, you know, biomedical focus of psychiatry, how that approach works with perhaps your more person-centered, more spiritual approach. So, you know, how, how do those worlds kind of coexist? <laughs> well, they they can only coexist if the psychiatrist also recognizes there's a spiritual dimension to our life. And we have, James, we've been so fortunate to have a wonderful psychiatrist who's been with us from the very beginning. And um, as he and he is a team player. So it's very challenging because many psychiatrists are used to being at the top of the totem pole. But we invite the psychiatrist to join this team. So we work together as colleagues. We share our insights. We've all had a vast amount of life experience and professional experience. And as our psychiatrist said, you know, he said, well, I'm only helping with the tapering, but you all are doing the real work. Was well, That was a pretty much of a quote for him. And I remember leaving his office once because I tend to be try to be a fly on the wall 
in the session. So I'm witnessing the seeker. The seeker always, you know, it's up to the seeker, but oftentimes they want me to be there. So it's another set of eyes and ears. And leaving one day, I turned to the seeker and said to her, so how was that for you? It was her first time meeting Nels. And um, she said, I feel totally empowered. It's the first time I used to go with my mother and the, my mother and psychiatrist would talk and no one would ever listen to me. And so we're fortunate, you know, but I would like to also say, James, I heard recently from a doctor out in the West of the United States, her main clientele are suicidal psychiatrists. Wow. Nice. You know, there are a lot of people out there who go into psychiatry with the best of intentions and they get wrapped up in a system and they know, and I've spoken to many of them, they know the meds are not the answer, but they don't know how to battle that, how to work with that, how to transform that, you know? So, yeah. And then I've also developed a connection with them. a lot of the craftspeople in the area, there's a lot in this Brattleboro area, the southeast of Vermont. And um, I went and met with many wonderful uh, blacksmith, a glass blower, stained glass maker, potter, and, and others, telling them about inner fire, telling them how important it is for these people in their recovery to help them get out of their heads into their limbs. And so we have these wonderful and, in some cases, pretty courageous craftspeople who will work with our seekers. So they're here for a period of time. There's, they can still be in the tapering process, so they can be a bit wobbly. And the glass blowing helps them because you have to get in your body for your own safety to know what you're doing. You know, so there's, James, there's risk. There's risk in life. And there's risk in this, but we've seen remarkable things. And so, yeah, so we have these different areas and different people who are, um, yeah, they're very loving people, you know, and, and I don't mean love sentimentally at all. Love is a force. And through love, you can, you know, this person can heal and you hold on to, there are always times when an individual will show you what I would say their higher self and faithfulness has to do with, you never lose sight of that. So they can go through their, you know, we have a, we have an anger is okay, but violence is unacceptable policy. Anger is one of one of the first emotions expressed in the tapering process. And many people feel ashamed of the anger. And from my experience, anger is blocked creative energy. It's energy that should be flowing, but for one reason or another, it's been dammed up. Yeah. And we also, I also remind people, we all have tear ducts, men and women. We all have tear ducts and they need to be used. Crying is totally accepted. And encouraged, you know, the crying is letting go. It totally is. And I remember one time speaking with a seeker and, um, well, this was at the rehab where I worked. And, um, and by the way, we are not a treatment center. We do not do things to people, right? So that was a key, key thing. But I remember he started to tell his story. And I could feel tears stirring in me. And there was, you know, my professional had said, you're, you should not cry. You should, you know, this is, and, and I thought I'm crying, you know, it's, I'm going to let it come. And I remember he looked at me and he said, are you crying? And I said, well, yes, I guess I am crying, you know? And he said, why? And I said, because you've had such a challenging life. It's amazing what you've gone through. And my heart goes out to you. And so all of these emotions, and whenever we see somebody expressing a certain emotion, we sh- it would be wise for us to realize, well, I have that in me too. I'm a human being, and I have the full spectrum. There's nothing that one of those guys did in prison 
that if, and many of them did it under the influence of a substance. And, and there's nothing that any one of them did in prison that I could not do as well if I was under the influence of a substance. And I think that's very important to realize. We really are brothers and sisters. And I think it's extremely important for people to appreciate and look at what the withdrawal symptoms are or the side effects are of these medications. We're all concerned. And now I'm, I'm putting my head really out there, James, because we all know the suicidal rate in this country has really gone up. But people are not acknowledging that there's a relationship between the side effects of these medications or the withdrawal symptoms of these medications and suicide. And it's in small print. You look and you see. And if we really want to help with the suicidal issues in this country and in England and all over, particularly the Western countries, we need to look at what these medications are doing. Yeah, I agree. I think certainly in the UK, I've seen a real reluctance to admit that psychotropic medications can be involved in in any way, shape or form in, in, in people choosing to take their own lives. And, and I think if a responsible society has to consider every every aspect of that, no matter what it might be, but that there is real protectionism going on, that the you know, the drugs for mental health challenges can't be at fault. And of course, they do help people, but we also need to talk about the harm that they can do. Exactly. And I do want to emphasize, they can be helpful for a period of time. But typically, in the years that I've been working in this realm, in the years of inner fire, typically one medication leads to another, to another, to another, to numerous hospitalizations. We all know this, you know, and we have to realize that we have to help the soul to heal. You're not doing anything by tweaking with the brain. You know, it's like that's so superficial. <laughs> I'm sorry. It is so superficial. And we are not machines. You know, well, you know this, James, in the mental health world, there's this disgusting term, which is maintaining to maintain a human being. I'm sorry. We maintain tractors and trucks. We help heal human beings, you know, and I think it's the view of the human being. Human beings are so blooming complicated and we want them to be simple. So we treat them as if they're machines, but it's wrong. We can't. And I remember in our first year, leaving the office one day, thinking and laughing, finding myself laughing to myself that when anyone could imagine that there is one way of helping an individual or individuals, this actually is an artistic process. You have to have the wisdom behind you. You have to have the years of experience and the study and the training and all of that behind you. And then you draw from that as an artist draws certain colors from his palette to create a painting, to help something, someone to blossom and unfold. And I think that's, I mean, that's one thing, James, is, um, you know, people have asked me, well, how do you know when someone's ready to go? Or how do you know when someone is healed? Now, first of all, I stress to all the parents, we do not fix your child. Your child is not broken. And you can have the best program in the world and the best system in the world. And if an individual is not ready or simply says, no, I've done enough. You cannot make anybody do anything. And it's very humbling work. But in response to this question, if people, if while someone has been at inner fire, they have been able to connect with what I call the divine creative self, which is inside every single one of us because we're human beings. And they know I have the creativity and the inner resources. And that doesn't mean I don't turn to other people for help, but I know that I can work with any challenge that comes my way in life. I may not like it. I may be fed up with here. It is the same thing all over again. Why does this keep happening to me? That's a wake up call. Challenges come to us. And I think sometimes we seek challenges to help us go beyond our box to help us to our self-imposed box, to help us 
become who we're really meant to be on this journey of being a striving human being, you know? Absolutely. And Beatrice, again, you know, in looking through the website, one of the things that struck me was where you talk about helping people to taper off medications. And, you know, I got the distinct sense there that, you know, you don't put a a specific time limit on that, that, you know, you're kind of responsive to how the, how long the person needs to take or take to get off, whereas obviously, you know, many other places have a six-week program or a one-month program or, or whatever. So, you know, I, I, I was pleased to see that, you know, you, you kind of allow people time to come off. And, I, you know, I just wondered if you had any, you know, in, any reflections on your learnings from, you know, watching people come off their their drugs while getting all you know involved in all the other activities and you know because that that there's so little known about people's experiences of tapering yeah for sure first of all james what we do is we have unless there's a benzodiazepine okay where the sooner you can carefully slowly come off the better but typically we have people be at inner fire for three weeks to get into the rhythm because it's the rhythm that's going to be their anchor as they taper and then we meet, they meet regularly, um, regularly. And I mean, perhaps once every two weeks, in some cases, once a month with our psychiatrist, because the program is so engaging. And we go with the seeker. The seeker is part of, now we've had some people come in and say, you know, for their three day visit and say, I want to cold turkey off my benzo straight away. And it's like, no way. No way. We're not going to be involved with that. But with the seeker's agreement, the psychiatrist and the seeker decide on a tapering process. But you never taper again until you have found the earth under your feet from this little taper that you've done. And I think we all know that the lower you get, the more extreme the reaction to the tapering can be. So you can take sort of bigger jumps to begin with. But still, I have been so relieved, James. We encourage, if you've been on medication for a number of years, and we've had people who've been on medication for half their life, um, and talk about courageous people. One woman said, I don't know who I'm going to find when I get off, you know. You do that. You just go very slowly, carefully, and you need to stay engaged in the program. Yeah, so that you've got to do the activities that get you out of your head with your thoughts swirling round and round and round. And so we're trying to bring people into um, into their limbs in that sense. And so and I am so relieved, James, that it can be. Yeah, I was going to say if it's for a length of if they've been on meds for a long time to give it a year, I have been so relieved to know that we don't have to race through this because the rebound can be so awful. And we do not want three times in these years, people have had to go to the hospital where the anger, I, we say, but you know, anger is okay. Violence is unacceptable because everyone is here because they believe in your healing and they don't want to get attacked. And we've had people who have had to therefore go to the hospital. But what happens at the hospital, James, is they get hiked up on their meds. All their hard work is totally undone. And then they've, they've give, been given a cocktail of medications up and up and down and up and down. The food is awful. There's no air to breathe. And um, they don't get outside. And so Really, we what I would like to be able to do, and I have to look into how this would be possible, but that under all circumstances, we keep people here at Inner Fire. And maybe as Dr. John Weir Perry from San Francisco, who started Diabasis House back in the 70s, and he had a tremendous amount of success with people wrestling with schizophrenia, what was called schizophrenia. And he had a mattress room. So I would like us to eventually we need to raise more money in order to build the buildings that are still awaiting us. Um, but to have a mattress room where with their permission, their agreement, they can go and they will not hurt themselves and they will not hurt anyone else. And they will get good quality food. They'll be still in the community. We know the person, we know their journey. 
But what I have noticed in the tapering process is, first of all, if you've been on a suppressant, then there's this, as one young man said to me, it's as if you're suddenly overwhelmed with all these colors and all these emotions. Everything comes flooding over you. And then there's another stage. So someone, for instance, recently, someone with us who is off medication for the first time in eight years, right? And in, it's beautiful. But his process was laughing hysterically for three hours. So you sit with them. You accompany them. And a, and a typical psychiatrist would say, you send them to the, psych- to the hospital. And it's like, no, we don't do that here. You know, so we go through it. And after three hours, he suddenly said, I'm fine. I want to go take a shower, you know. And then the next stage, he came into breakfast swearing a blue streak. Okay, so he's in this stage now, you know. And so it can, There, you, you begin to recognize different stages in people, you know. And then in this particular case, he did tip into violence and he had to go. It, it was too far. And we had, he had to go to the hospital. But the beautiful thing is he was not forcibly medicated. And he had, he's now, um, he was, we, we testified on his behalf because there had been no violence. In, the, in 35 days of him being off medication in the hospital. Now, the hospital wanted him to be medicated, and we fought for him. And he's, he's now, he may return still to inner fire, but at the moment, he's gone back to his family. And since he has left, there is still no violence. So we begin to wonder, and we're watching this, can violence be simply a stage that one goes through? And we have to have one-on-one, and we have to have relief for one-on-one people, you know, for when someone needs one-on-one. But the other thing, James, which I, which I really need to touch on is in our fire, though we're a not-for-profit, and I will say that um, we are private pay. And at the moment, the Department of Mental Health, the Vermont Department of Mental Health is interested in us, and I'm really hoping they'll use us as a pilot project because we're actually less than a third of what the state pays a day. People will be reclaiming their lives. There'll be one day, they'll be off their psychotropic meds. There'll be one day taxpaying citizens. I mean, why why not support Inner Fire? But we do have a supporter seeker fund. And that I would be incredibly grateful if people would be able to donate and support those who don't have the money to come to Inner Fire because Inner Fire needs to be available for people regardless of their, their race, their religion, their financial background, their gender, you know. And we were very fortunate in our very first year. You know, I mentioned this to one of our board members in the first year and, and he said, well, maybe one day. And I said, no. From day one, we have to have people, you know, from a spectrum. And um, indeed, there was a man who came to us who had been imprisoned in the city of Detroit for 26 years and proven innocent. And he had then, he was released. He was out on the streets. He was homeless. Can you believe it? And he became, he wrestled with crack. And they heard about Inner Fire. Someone who knew who worked with him in prison knew about Inner Fire, and he came and he spent a year with us. And I thought, you know, the universe has a wonderful sense of humor because not only is he Afro American, but because of being awarded a fair amount of money, he was able to afford Inner Fire. But that's what it. We have to make Inner Fire available somehow, and. Um, Yeah, and since we started, actually, I haven't even taken an income. Our guides are, I'd say they're well paid, but they don't get benefits. You know, it's it's above minimum wage. You know, so people are here because they believe in the healing process. They, They want to be that support. And it's a mission. You know, I'd say it's, um, it's not just a nice idea, but it's actually become 
a reality. And we're being watched from all over the world, James. I got an email from South Africa saying, even knowing inner fire exists gives us hope. And, um, and what I'm hoping, what we're in the process of doing right now is raising money for our arts and drama barn. And what I'm hoping will be the case, what I'd love to do is in January and February that all the guides and seekers at Inner Fire put on a production, theatrical production, which we offer to the remarkable community of this southeastern corner of Vermont who totally support us in so many ways. But then, you know, there has not been a single parent or spouse who's been here who hasn't said, I need Inner Fire. And it dawned on me, if we can raise the 300000 to build this arts and drama barn, then we could have retreats for parents. Parents are exhausted. They're confused. They're angry. You know, and we could have retreats where they could engage in the therapies. They could split wood. They could learn how to cook as well. And many of the seekers say they would like to split wood alongside their parents, you know and so on. And then it dawned on me, having heard from this doctor who works with suicidal psychiatrists, I thought we could have workshops for psychiatrists where they could come to a place where they could see people healing, you know, who are taping from their medications and who are saying to me, you know, I can think again, you know, and when you become the medications just typically disconnect you from your clarity of thinking, from your heartfelt feeling, from your ability to do, and you began to live a zombie-type existence. Who wants to live like that, where you don't have a chance to give your gifts, you know? So that's what we're hoping that actually, and there's a farm not far from us, a, a little ways down the road, prime agricultural land, and that could become a life-sharing community because some of the folks have been to us. In fact, their life is even more complicated and they probably would never be able to live alone, but they would love to milk the goats or harvest or work in the garden and live in an active community rather than a group home where they sit around and return to smoking cigarettes and drinking energy drinks. You know, what is out there for these people after they've completed their time at Inner Fire? Yeah, well, I, I you know, I, I know that running retreats like this can, can, seem quite expensive but actually you know if you look at the uk care that it that appears free on the surface probably costs significantly more for the individual longer term when they are stuck on medications and they are stuck at home and can't get back to work and can't contribute so you know i think what you're doing is it, it's about sustainability isn't it it's about the sustainability of that person to to carry on with their lives after some help yeah and it's it's, it's about also honoring that everybody has a gift to give. They have a life to live, you know, and if they're medicated, I mean, what's our society going to be like, James, if the medication continues? You know, look at our leaders. You know, we're really challenged. But if we can't think clearly, if we don't can't connect with our feelings, I mean, that's pretty scary, you know. But I do want to say that we do have people, of course, we're not a locked facility. And if somebody has done a certain number of months and they feel, I've done it, I'm okay, I'm ready to go. Sometimes we actually can give our blessing and say, yeah, you know, go ahead. You seem really great. Other times people go and we feel you're not ready to go. But young people are also impatient. And they want the quick fixes and you can't blame them. They've grown up in a society where everything is automatic. And the idea that there's a process to healing is a novel idea, you know? So just to say, we work with whoever comes. And, but you know, but the reason why I also encouraged a year, James, is because at, at another rehab where I was working, I saw people coming and going all the time. But I did not see a lot of healing going on. And the only thing I could experience is parents are throwing a lot of good money away. And, you know, these have become profitable businesses. But I must say, I'm not interested in that. I'm only interested in healing. And 
of course, and I've said to our board, I will always have the back of this seeker. And you all, and of course, I do also have to be aware of the finances and to keep it in the black and so on. But we're never choosing finances over somebody's healing journey, you know. Well, I'm so excited to see what you're doing and, you know, to read about the, the results that you're getting. And, you know, I wish we had more like the, the difference that you're making o- over here in the UK. You know, there are one or two places, but of course, nowhere near enough. And, um, you know, I think I know that personally for me, uh, a key part of my part of my recovery was learning new skills, you know, and, and learning again to connect that I can add value and I can make a difference and I can actually learn new things. Whereas for the longest time on the medications, I felt like that was as good as life was ever going to get. So, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to read about your work and to read about the, the, the range and breadth and width of activities and creative expression that you, uh, you provide through Inner Fire. I think it's incredible. Yeah. Well, thank you for recognizing that James. And I also want to congratulate you In my experience, healing is the process of tapping untapped wells within our innermost self. That's, that's, I guess that's my quote or something like this, but it's, um, but I think you've, you've just described that you tapped parts of yourself you never knew were there, you know, and that's, that's remarkable, James. And, and and also to say, you know, it's interesting because I have been asked to start an inner fire in Texas, in Northern California, in Michigan, and actually in the UK. But until we finish the building here, you know, we need to, we we just completed and Robert Whitaker, who actually came to our our launching, celebratory launch back in 2013. Um, he and Sandy Steingard were our keynote speakers and, you know, Robert's always had our back. And then he was with us recently in July where um, we had the opening of the East Wing of the Inner Fire Home. And that's on our, our website and you can see that. And he describes so beautifully the history of the mental health world. So who knows, once we get, you know, the West Wing and the main part of the building and our therapeutic huts, because we want people, of course, nature is a huge part of the healing journey. And to watch the seasons and to walk through the woods during the seasons, and we'll eventually have therapeutic huts. We have 43 acres dotted here and there. So the seekers will walk along paths that they have made in the woods to get, you know, going past this ash tree or this oak tree and to find. and um just the role of nature james is what i'm saying yeah yeah absolutely i I think it's uh you know for me it's connection on so many levels isn't it perhaps connecting with your connecting with feelings that you've either either denied or have been medicating away and connecting with peers and guides and other people going through the same process and connecting with new skills and you know learning to express yourself and connect with nature and you know I, i I, honestly, Beatrice, I don't see many of those things being a feature of mainstream mental health treatment. So I'm so glad to see that those things are so important to what Inner Fire is doing. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, the image came to me one time in the early days. I thought, but we're just a drop. You know, at the most we'll ever have is 12 seekers here. And at the moment we can have up to up to nine with the East Wing having been completed. But I thought to myself, but we're just a drop. And then having used homeopathy, um, personally, myself, all my life, and brought up my family with homeopathy and so, I thought to myself, yes, but I do believe in homeopathy. And we may be a drop, but we're a potentized drop. (laughs) So you don't know. And people are watching us from around the world. And um, you just have to begin and remarkable things come as you begin i'd say and we have it's been amazing what we've managed to do just in these five and a half years and we're not alone and i every day i awake so so grateful for this opportunity to with wonderful colleagues make a little bit of a difference and people's on our website the testimonies you can read testimonies of people who are 
incredibly grateful for what. But the interest, the most important thing, James, is one father said, you healed my daughter. I said, I have not healed your daughter. Instead, your daughter has healed herself because she stayed engaged in the Inner Fire Comprehensive Program, which works with the whole human being, yeah, of body, soul, and spirit. <laughs> and Beatrice, if, if listeners wanted to know more about Inner Fire, then, then uh, wh- where should they go to find out more? Our website is www.innerfire.us. And to make it easy, on the homepage, there is an interview which gives a pretty comprehensive picture of Inner Fire. And under our TV tab, you can also watch a more recent interview with the celebratory launch of the, um, or the opening of the Inner Fire East Wing. Um, And then, of course, if you're in the area, please give a ring and come by. We're very happy. We do have on our Facebook page, please have a look there. We have our monthly open houses. Yeah, and please also, if people could also help spread the word, because, you know, I do get one spouse, one mother will say, but my husband doesn't, my son will not take his medications and my husband wants him to take the medications. And I encourage the father to watch the website, look at the website and watch the interview, because many people have given it into the idea that you have to take these medications. And when they realize there's a choice, then they get hope again. And maybe James would be all right. I'd like to um, just share a verse that we say, our board begins our meetings with this verse. And at one of the guide meetings, we also say it. And the seekers also say this in the evenings when they begin the evening activity. May I just share this with you? Yeah, please do. That, that, That would be lovely. All right. And I think people will understand why we use this. Love is for the world what the sun is for outer life. No soul could live if love departed from the world. It is the moral sun of the world. To spread love over the earth to the degree possible, to promote love, that alone is wisdom. Yeah, those are words that I found in a book that I read by Rudolf Steiner, Love and Its Meaning in the World. And I think it's a good time to remember the role of love. And as uh, as a dear colleague of mine once said, a physician once said, the best medicine for humans is love. Someone asked, what if it doesn't work? The physician smiled and said, increase the dose. (laughs) (laughs) And a lovely lady who is who you all people I'm at in America may know. Her name is Julie Burns. She was on our board. And I'd like people to know that she just crossed the threshold. Her breast cancer had spread. She crossed the threshold yesterday at 2.15. And I'll share her story with you all on Mad in America again. But she's she's with us all for sure. She, she yeah. is. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you, James, very much. Beatrice, thank you. That 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 was wonderful. It was so so warm, and you know, you you, you described what you do so so beautifully. Thank you. Before we finish, w- was there anything else that you wanted to share? Or, but I would like to also say that. I hope more and more we can celebrate our diversity. You know, we're a rich palette. We're so many different colors and textures. And I, my concern is that the medication, the tendency is wanting to homogenize us as human beings. And don't forget our spirit is very strong and we can do a remarkable amount by engaging and acknowledging our spirit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Beatrice, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about you and the, and the work of Inner Fire and, and the wonderful things that you are doing. And I, I really hope you can 
get investment from people to continue to do and, and expand upon what you do. And, and hopefully we'll, it's a model that we'll see replicated elsewhere in the world in the not too distant future. Thank you, James. And thank you to everyone else who's doing such remarkable work and trying to bring choice as well. I'm very grateful. So I just want to thank Beatrice for taking the time to chat. And as a reminder, if you'd like to know more about the work of Inner Fire, you can visit the website innerfire.us. And please consider becoming a supporter of their wonderful work. So as always, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.